left. Steve, what'd you do with the other one? Oh, <laughs> okay. <cool. laughs> uh, author's got to sell books, you know. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I understand I have one hour, right? Because dinner is soon. So I'm going to talk fast, because normally I give this talk, it takes about an hour and a half. Um, as Steve mentioned, I'm a professor at Lewis and Clark. I teach Indian law classes, and uh, I am a judge at the, for the Grand Ronde tribe in, in Middle Oregon. And I'm a citizen of the Eastern Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma. In 2003, my tribal council wanted to put me on the uh, National Bicentennial Commission for the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And at first I told my chief, well, no, I'm not a history professor, I'm a law professor, so I can't write about Lewis and Clark. And I didn't have tenure then, so I had to, you know, please the dean. Now I have tenure, I don't have to please anyone but myself. So that's an inside joke for people that know about tenure and stuff. But uh, I called my chief back and I said, well, I cannot miss the opportunity to work on this Lewis and Clark stuff, the 200th anniversary, because guess what, I won't be here for the 300th anniversary. So this book and the work I'm going to talk to you came out of working with the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial and the Doctrine of Discovery. And I wanted to study and research about what Thomas Jefferson knew about the Doctrine of Discovery and what Lewis and Clark themselves might know. Now since I only have an hour today, I'm going to talk less about those points. I'm going to talk more about an anti-Columbus message. <laughs> Last year at this time, I spoke at University of Virginia, and they wanted me there to counteract the big hoopla that was going on about Columbus, and so I did my best. So I'll do my best to be acerbic and controversial, <laughs> and we'll be as anti-Columbus as we possibly can be. But what we're going to talk about is the doctrine of discovery, a legal principle that Europeans and the Catholic Church developed so that European Christians could claim the rest of the world. Now, so few of us know anything about it today because there's just, how much left is there in the world to claim anymore? Well, there's, you know, there doesn't seem to be anywhere you can go and stick your flag and your cross in the soil anymore. Ah, but does anyone know what Russia did August 2nd, 2007? North Pole. Yeah. Yeah. Stuck their flag in the seabed of the Arctic Ocean. Does anyone know what China did just this past summer? sent a sub, same as Russia did, two miles below the surface and stuck the Chinese flag in the South China Sea, in the seabed. Now why did they do that? Well, Russia is very plainly claiming the 10 billion tons of oil and gas that is found under the North Pole. One quarter of the Earth's known reserves of oil and natural gas is under the North Pole. And China's doing the identical same claim. And in fact, folks, what's standing on the moon right now? Oh, we stuck our flag in. And those moon rocks we brought home, if they had been solid gold, who owned those moon rocks? Moon people? Moonies? Keith Moon from the Who? Only the old people know who Keith Moon is. No, the United States claims to own them. And we, if they had been solid gold, we wouldn't have given them to the United Nations to share with the poor people of the world, would we? We would have kept them. In fact, you may be stunned to know that President Nixon broke one of those moon rocks up and he put little pieces inside plastic cubes and he gave 138 of these plastic cubes with a little bit of moon rock in it to the leaders of other countries. Well, a few years ago, one of those moon rocks came for sale on the black market and the United States brought a lawsuit to reclaim it. Even after Nixon had given it away, we assumed it was still ours. And in fact, the lawsuit, you can look it up, it's called the United States versus one loose side cube containing lunar material. 2003, the district court in Washington, D.C. So I digress, but what am I talking about? The claims of ownership that Europeans made wherever they went, and how did they do it? The cross and the flag in the soil. They were claiming it for their God and for their country. And that's what I'm talking about. So when my chief said, you know, do you want to be on this Lewis and Clark thing, I knew about the Doctrine of Discovery because I teach Indian law. This is the number one and the first case that you cover in federal Indian law classes is a case we're going to talk about tonight, Johnson v. McIntosh from 1823, in which the United States Supreme Court adopted this international law and in fact gave it its name. Because what we're going to see is that our founding fathers called this legal principle by another name. They called it preemption. And we'll explain that when we get to it. 
But starting with Johnson v. McIntosh in 1823, when it just kept using the word discovery, discovery, this continent was claimed by discovery by the English, the French, and the Spanish, the Russians, anyone else who came here. And so today we know it as the doctrine of discovery. And again, when I get to this point, why do so few Americans know about it anymore? Because there's just no place to find it anymore you know, on the earth, it seems like. In fact, we're having to go under sea now. But you know, with global warming, some islands are appearing, right? Hong Island, off the west coast of Greenland, has appeared with this retreat of the ice and stuff. And Denmark and Canada are arguing over who owns it. They have both sent their foreign ministers flying to that island with troops, and guess what they did? <laughs> Raised their flag. And Denmark left a bottle of brandy and a sign that said, Welcome to Denmark. And uh, Canada didn't think that's very funny, so they sent their minister in helicopters and with soldiers, and they marched around on the island. Wow! And, and we'll get to this. I'll look on the map. I'll ask you something. Who knows what the word 5440 or fight means? What is that phrase, 5440 or fight? See, I'm a law professor. I call on students. <laughs> we were going to own part of what is now Canada. Okay, folks. In 1844, President James K. Polk runs for office, and his slogan is 54, 40, or fight. Today, I can tell by the blank looks that most of us don't have the faintest idea what that means. But do you think every American alive knew what it meant in, in 1844? What president would use a slogan that people didn't understand? So James K. Polk was running on a platform of the international law, the American claims to the Oregon country. And you're exactly right. Our border, I wish I had a pointer, our border today with Canada is at the 49th parallel. And you can see how that runs across the purple part right up there and comes out just to the straight Juan de Fuca in Washington. Well, that's the 49th degree of parallel. But we were going to go to war with England that was James K. Polk's slogan if we didn't get clear up to the 54th parallel, which is the southeastern tip of Alaska. Now I'm going to explain to you, and we'll talk about how international law defined these borders. Look at the Louisiana Territory, folks. What makes those borders, that yellow? What makes the borders of the Oregon country? Well, we'll get to that, but international law defined it. Why did the United States have a claim to the Pacific Northwest, to the Oregon country? Because Robert Gray, a Boston seafarer, sailed up 25 miles up the mouth of the Columbia in 1792, allegedly the first European slash American to find that river. And he claimed that river then for America, and he named the river. You know where the word Columbia comes from? He was in the ship, the Columbia Red Aviva. So he named the river after his own ship. And then where does President Jefferson send Lewis and Clark? Does he tell Lewis and Clark to go to the beaches of Southern California and have a good tan and learn surfing? No, he tells them to go to the mouth of the Columbia River because Jefferson is using the Lewis and Clark expedition to help claim the Oregon country for the United States. Lewis, Meriwether Lewis, in fact, folks, carried with him a brandy iron. It's at the Oregon Historical Society in Portland if you want to come up and see it. It's a brass branding iron, probably weighs about five pounds. Who goes backpacking for 28 months and carries five pound pieces of brass? Anybody in here? <laughs> so this branding iron must have been pretty important to him. Of course, Mary Rather Lewis didn't have to carry it. He had all those soldiers to carry it, right? But anyway, I digress. See why I take an hour and a half? The branding iron says U period, S period, C A P T period. He was a U.S. captain in the Army, M period, Lewis. The branding iron is not mentioned in the journals of the Lewis and Clark expedition while they're in this part of the continent. The moment they crossed the Rocky Mountains, all of the six writers of the journals said, we know we're now leaving the United States. When they were going into what was called the Oregon country, they knew they were going into the area that you can, I don't know if you can read that, but it was claimed by England, Russia, Spain, and the United States. So they knew they were in unclaimed or unowned territory. Let's word it that way. Gee, there were thousands of native people that lived there, weren't there? But their ownership, their existence was discounted completely under this international law. It was only where European Christians went. That's all that mattered. 
But now that they're out in this Oregon country, you can read in the journals 10 or 12 times. Uh, William Clark is usually writing, and he says, I and the men carved our name. Captain Lewis branded it. And this branding iron is not mentioned in those journals while they're east of the Rocky Mountains. But out here in the west, it became important. Well, gee, folks, I don't know if you've seen the analogy yet, but it sounds to me like they were sticking the American flag and the American cross in the soil when Meriwether Lewis was branding his name on trees and on rocks. And I don't want to, let me mention this right now. Of course, you, you know in the War of 1812, the English captured that story of the town, the Oregon town that's at the mouth of Columbia. At the end of the war, they didn't give it back fast enough. And so President James Monroe and Secretary of State John Quincy Adams ordered two American ambassadors, a, a naval captain and an ambassador, to go to the mouth of the Columbia River. And the direct command that was written by both the President and Secretary of State John Quincy Adams to these two Americans was to go to the mouth of the Columbia River and, quote, by some symbolic means reassert the United States ownership of the Oregon country, period, close quote. So when John Biddle, a naval captain, and William Prevost traveled to the mouth of the Columbia River, they don't stick the flag and cross in the soil but they do call the Chinook Indians around to watch them, and they hang up a metal sign and nail it to a tree, and it says this territory belongs to the United States. So it's about as funny as doing that, too. And they also then took a shovel and turned some dirt. And if anyone in here is a lawyer or has taken first-year property law, you know what that is. That came from England in the 1200s, in the 1300s. That's how you prove the sale of land back before there were places to record deeds. You turned some dirt and you handed it to the person who had just bought it from you. And you just told everyone, there's the new owner, bye, I'm leaving. So these American ambassadors ordered by the president to engage in doctrine of discovery, symbolic acts to possess territory. That's the doctrine of discovery. Okay, talk's over, let's go eat. Oh. <laughs> it can't be. Like I said, this is the case you start teaching federal Indian law with in law school, or wherever you study. They'll start with this case. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote three seminal Indian law cases that still provide the foundations for Indian law today. He was our most famous Chief Justice, and these are the three most famous Indian law cases the Supreme Court has ever decided, and this is the first one. They're called the Marshall Trilogy, three cases, of course, and we teach them in the first few days of Indian law because they still form, to this day, the basis of federal Indian law. And almost everything that Chief Justice John Marshall wrote in this case and in two cases that followed, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1831 and Wooster versus Georgia in 1832, are the three foundational cases, and almost everything that Marshall wrote is still federal Indian law today. 